So welcome, everybody. Welcome back to many of you. Thank you for the new folks who, for whom this is their first week. Um, this is Deepening Your Spiritual Roots and Growing Your Tree of Life, Living a Spiritually Centered and Self-Actualized Life. And last week, we talked about allowing our life to heal us. And we talked about the notion of saying yes to life and of trying to transcend the tendency to close when challenging situations and feelings come up in our life. And we also talked a bit about the challenge of opening to receive and how receiving was more vulnerable and sometimes even scarier, although that wouldn't be what you would think at first than giving, because in giving there's more control and in receiving there's a need to allow and surrender. So this week, I really wanted to kind of focus on this energy of receptivity and allowing and receiving. Um, in Taoism, it's called the yin energy or the divine feminine. Uh, it's the mode of life of receptivity of many people who are artists and creative people are very, very familiar with this when they talk about um, that the words are coming to them or the music is coming through them. And what we study in Transforming Cellular Memory, the Monday night groups, is really the healing energy of the Divine Feminine and also a way of life, and I mentioned this some, a few talks ago, of really letting the Divine Feminine lead us. And that this path and living a spiritually centered life is about being receptive to the insight and energy coming to us from universal intelligence. So the receptivity is the feminine. And then the acting on the, on the guidance is the masculine. So unlike our patriarchal society for the last few thousand years, um, the idea is really that the divine feminine should be in charge. And I know lots of women love hearing that. And lots of men are really surprised by that. But today we're going to celebrate the Divine Feminine and the allowing, receiving energy. And so when we talk about the challenge and vulnerability of opening to receive, we talk about how can we start to trust? How can we start to trust that it's safe for us to open and say yes to our lives and allow new experiences and challenges and, and great things and not so great things to come into our lives, how can we start to trust and say yes and embrace and allow as opposed to resisting and judging and holding our life at bay? And we talked about how the holding our life at bay and the resistance keeps us stuck. And it's only in the allowing and embracing that we can allow the energy to move through us, we can allow our feelings to come up, are some scars that we've talked about to be released, and therefore change can happen in our lives. So ironically, people think that accepting what is in their lives is a way of saying yes to things that they don't really like in their lives. But actually, accepting and fully embracing and allowing those things to come into our lives and really feeling those feelings is a catalyst for changing, is a catalyst for transformation. It's the resistance that keeps us stuck. But I think people really feel, and for most of my life, if I let this in, if I don't resist it, I don't want my life to stay stuck in this mess, whatever mess that is. But it will stay, the only way to assure that it stays stuck in that mess is to resist it, is to not let it pass through your life, not let it pass through your body, not let it pass through your emotions. So how can we learn to trust? So we started also talking last week about universal intelligence and the premise that there is an intelligence of the universe. It's been operating for 14 billion years, that there is a guiding energy of creating more conscious life that is moving through creation. And then we talked about the fact that we are connected to that intelligence, that we are a part of the universe, we are connected to everything in the universe, and that we have encoded within us the same intelligence that is operating in the universe. And when we talk about things like listening, turning within, listening to the still small voice is how the Old Testament calls it, we are connecting 
to the universal intelligence and getting guidance. And sometimes it looks like a voice coming from within us, I really want this, I really don't like this situation, this needs to change. <clears throat> sometimes it's in the form of somebody says something on television and you weren't really listening and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, that was just for me. Or somebody says something to you in your life. Or somebody says something in a movie. Or you read something. Or you have, and I've mentioned this example because it happens to me, I'm, I'm not good at getting myself off of lit email lists. So I just get like thousands of emails, plus I get a lot of emails for work. But I'm scrolling through and then just something shines. And you just, that, you have a calling to open that and it's got some information for you. Maybe it's about a group that you should go to or a book that you should read. You go to the, you go to the bookstore, I know most of us don't go to the bookstore anymore. A book stands out or even online when you're searching and Googling and looking for something to, to, to watch on YouTube, something stands out and you feel energy in it. And we talked about following your energy. And that energy of excitement in your life is your connection, is your spiritual center, is your connection to universal intelligence. So that the universe is speaking to us all the time through things that come through us when, we are getting, when we're quiet, through messages, and also through messages that come to us through our lives. And then we talked about the law of attraction, and we talked about sort of the easy sounding part of it, which is that we attract things into our lives, and that it is done unto us as we believe. And so we also talked about vibration, and the idea that our beings, that we're all made of energy, the whole universe is made of energy, and that we vibrate at a certain frequency, and that the frequency is emitted as a transmitter into the universe and we attract experiences into our lives that are a match toward our vibration. And we talked about how tricky that is because it sounds like in movies like The Secret, if I make a vision board of a big mansion and a Rolls Royce and I think about it all the time, that I'm going to attract that into my life. But actually, the reality is, is that you can't fake your vibration. And we talked about this as well that if I'm carrying with me unworthiness, feelings of shame, feelings of I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm unworthy, if we have a set point for our happiness that we talked about also last week, that if we go past some sort of achievement in our lives that we don't feel we deserve, that we get triggered and we want to squash ourselves and it brings up these old feelings of unworthiness, if we're carrying those feelings in our, in our body, then we can think about the Rolls Royce or the, or the lover or the great job all we want, but we're actually going to attract things that, that are mirroring our unworthiness. So if we're holding on to our sadness because we're not letting ourselves feel it, we're going to start attracting things that want, make us feel sad because life wants to heal us. And we talked about some scars. We talked about buried emotions and energy patterns that have been locked in our bodies. Eckhart Tolle calls this the pain body. And that in the process of our lives, there is so much that has happened to us, especially in childhood, that we couldn't really process, that we couldn't really allow ourselves to feel. And so those energy patterns don't go, they don't disappear, they get stuck, stuck in our bodies. And that those energy patterns, the Buddhists call samskaras, create a vibration and create a point of attraction towards things in our lives. So if I'm holding on to, I'm not worthy of, of partnership, or there's something wrong with me around relationships, I will keep attracting, for example, people who will prove to me that I'm right. People who will be emotionally unavailable. I did this for many years. Right? A lot of us have had the same relationship over and over again. And we say that we want to get married, or we say that we want to find a loving partner, or live with somebody, or really be intimate. But we're holding so much of this unworthiness, so much of this fear of intimacy in our lives. And so what we're holding is really what's attracting, not necessarily what we're wishing for. Because what we're holding emotionally has a stronger um, impact on our vibration than anything that we're thinking about or wishing for, which is really up in the head. And so. You can say that sounds challenging, but I would argue that's perfect. That that's the life as a healing journey. That our life is trying to heal us. So in attracting these, say, emotional, emotionally unavailable people into our lives, we really have two choices. 
right? We can resist. We can not allow ourselves to feel these deep feelings of whatever it was. We didn't get the love that we needed from when we were children. Or we were abandoned somehow emotionally or physically. Or all of these things that are, that are so, such hot, hot energy topics for us mm-hmm. around relationship. So we can meet these people, go through this kind of dance that we do. And then either two things happen. Either we break up with that person because it gets uncomfortable and because we're sick of them being un, you know, unavailable. Or, we're un, or, or, or they leave because, because they really are not truly available to us. And then sometimes we swap. And this is a little bit about relationships. Sometimes we find people finally who are available, but then we switch into being unavailable. And the truth is, anytime we're choosing someone who's unavailable, what we're doing is succeeding in protecting ourselves. Because we don't really want the intimacy because we're scared of it. So we say it's the other person's fault, but actually, we're putting it out there, right? We're resisting somebody who is available. So we can resist it, we can go through the dance, we can play out the same relationship over and over again, for example. Or we can really say, wow, this is bringing up some old feelings in me. This is what it felt like when my mother wasn't emotionally there for me, or when my father walked out when I was two, or whatever happened. Let me start doing my own work about my own repressed feelings so that I can stop having the same relationship over and over again because without bringing that stuff up, I'll just keep doing the same thing on the outside. And it happens in every area of life. It's not just in relationships. I'm just choosing that one, right? So eventually what we can do is finally start to look within, which is the whole premise of all of these talks. Instead of trying to fix it on the outside and just going back to the dating thing, I, you know was on Match.com and buying new clothes and getting in shape and all those things. But it wasn't until I turned within and really looked at, wow, there's some real fear of intimacy here. There's some real feelings of unworthiness around relationship here. I need to turn within and look at that and really face some of those feelings and really feel that old stuff. But as you allow, and we're back to that yin feminine energy of allowing, As you allow those feelings to finally come up, the feelings that have been in your body for 20, 10, 15, 30 years, to finally come up and be released, and this is a lot of the work that we do in Transforming Cellular Memory on Monday nights, as those things get released, your vibrational attraction point changes. And so therefore you will no longer unconsciously attract emotionally unavailable people into your life. So life will bring you whatever experience, this is Eckhart Tolle's quote, that is, that is most beneficial for the evolution of your consciousness. And it will bring it to you, not because necessarily you can, you know, you can call, you, not because life is nice, although I believe that we're all in cooperation, but you don't even have to look at it that way if you don't believe in a benevolent life force, you don't have to. It's just about attraction. I am holding something I am attracting something that is, a, that is a equivalent to what I'm holding, and I have two choices. If I choose the path of growth, I can face what wants to be triggered, which is, saying, which is the whole nature of saying yes to life, which is the whole nature of what we're talking about, allowing life to change and heal me. Or I can resist it and judge it and, and hold myself apart from it and break up with that person, or I, this is wrong, or I'm going to get a new job, I'm going to get a new relationship. I'm going to change this. I don't want to feel these feelings. Right? And then we can stay stuck. But we do have a choice, and life will bring us exactly what we need. And sometimes it sucks, and it's painful, and it's challenging. But it will bring us the exact attraction to what is really most up for us. It will attract something to us. And so this is the notion that, that life is trying to heal us. Right? That, we, that there's, there's something perfect happening. Although sometimes it sounds a little scary because it's, ugh, I've got these some scars living in my body. I don't really want to attract those things. I don't really want to work through this. I don't really want to feel these feelings. What I really want to do is get what I want, right? And so unfortunately, and I know some of my talks, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but it is involved. It involves work. It involves letting life heal you, going through the feelings, letting the feelings of sadness or pain or whatever is repressed in your body come up, be released, and then, and then you are no longer having that in your body. It's no longer attracting life. 
like is no longer attracting like on that vibration point, you get to move on. You get to, I, don't, I hate to use the word solve that problem, but, but bring something new into your life. And then something new that, you are, that is meant to be up for you, and that's the way your, your path works. And so that there is a perfection to your path, and that there's something guiding it. And so, you know, can we start to look at the moments in our lives and really embrace what's coming in, as opposed to resisting, as opposed to judging, as opposed to separating ourselves from them? Um, David Data is a great teacher. He has a line that I love, which is, embrace every moment as a lover and follow whatever direction love takes you. So that's the notion of that life is on our side. It's loving us. It's trying to heal us. It's trying to bring us things that we need so that we can change and grow and manifest our full potential and self-actualize. It's really trying. It's on our side. And so that, that, that brings to the notion that was the title of this week's talk. You know, can we see with the loving eyes of wholeness? Can we look at our lives and instead of looking at the challenges that come into our lives as an enemy, can we look at those as our friends? Can we start to deeply accept what is in our life? We talked about this a little bit, about meditation and about the voice in our head and allowing our feelings. We talked about getting into a witness conscious, consciousness the last couple of weeks and about really allowing the thoughts to come through us and the feelings to come through us and stop making them wrong and that the voice in the head will get quieter if we don't resist the thoughts but if we just allow them to come and watch them like images on a movie screen or like the credits rolling at the end of a movie. And similarly, can we allow and embrace the feelings that come up as a result of our life? Can we really get still, stop resisting, stop making it wrong, stop judging, stop, stop creating pictures in our lives about the way things should be, but start to allow everything to be as it is and that's, that's, that's the mode of meditation. And when we talked about that it's not about meditating for 20 minutes in the morning, necessarily, but it's about living a life as a constant meditation, of trying to recenter in your spiritual center, in your body, and trying to get quiet, and trying to have some perspective on the things that are happening, and to have some witness consciousness, and to see the thoughts, the, the worry, doubt, and fear thoughts that come up all the time, not as who you are, but as separate from you. Can I be the space for this? Is what Eckhart Tolle says, and we've talked about that. Can I be the space in which these forms arise, the thoughts, the feelings, but they're not me? Because if I can witness my thoughts, and I can witness my feelings, then they are not me. They are not really who I am. I am the vessel that holds all of these things. So, how can I, so if, I can, if I'm a vessel and I'm not these scary thoughts, and I'm not these scary feelings or painful feelings then I can have some distance from it. And then there's some room for me to embrace it and hold it more lightly. And so the challenges that come into our lives, they don't necessarily have to be so dramatic. We can have a sense that it is something passing through. This feeling is coming, and we talked about children. We talked about how children are so natural that they, something happens, they like it, they laugh, they don't like it, they cry. Five minutes later, they're laughing again, they're playing with blocks, they get hurt, they skin their knee, they cry for a minute, then they're on to laughing again. It's just spontaneous. They allow life to change them. They allow life to affect them. They allow the, life, the energy of life and the emotions of life to come through them. They don't hold on to it. They don't make it wrong. They don't say, you know, they do when they get a little older, they don't say, boys don't cry when they're two years old. They say boys don't cry when they're 10 years old. I mean, I don't know about the other boys, but that's what I learned. Boys don't cry, right? So that's a block. That's a pattern that gets resi of resistance. That's a rule. That's a belief. Boys don't cry. So therefore, I have a boo-boo in life. I get hurt. I don't cry. And that's the beginning of not allowing in your life, right? Because... There's some painful stuff in life, and we have a natural mechanism. We are biologically designed to release these feelings through crying, for example. 
for me, that was very hard. Once I learned boys don't cry, I couldn't cry until my 40s, right? I would just hold it, stuff it, drink it away with alcohol back, you know, years ago, eat it away, shop it away, exercise it away. But God forbid I actually feel my sadness, take a moment, have a good cry, and move on. You know, for women, oftentimes, it's a lot about feeling anger. And, and it's, there's no generalization. Some women are great about feeling anger, some men are great at crying. But this is just, oftentimes you see, that's a, that's a challenging emotion for, for a lot of women that I know. Men seem to be oftentimes more comfortable with their anger, but I don't want to make distinctions. It's just using it as an example. So, so how do we start to embrace every moment and every feeling as a lover? To really accept that, that what is coming to us is our friend and is designed for our evolution. It is really designed to help us to change and that allowing these things into our lives and allowing them to affect us is not getting us stuck in that bad situation. It's actually helping us transform that situation into something new and it's the resistance that keeps it stuck. And how do we live a life of non-judgment? How do we have less preferences? This is really hard and I want to just say, I didn't say before, this whole consciousness that I'm talking about, excuse me, this yin feminine energy is not what this culture that we're in is good at not what I was good at for the first 47 of my 49, 48 years this is really not the way most of us think because in our you know, male dominated and it's not just male in terms of men but the male consciousness of I'm going to control it, I'm going to plan it, I'm going to make it happen so I'm going to think about it, I'm going to plan it I'm going to organize it, I'm going to make it happen I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push through right? to allow and to have less preferences and to have less judgments. My, our teacher, Don Hansen, talks a lot about the pictures that we have in our lives. And I'll give you a funny example about that. Donna's picture of a partner was taller than me and didn't wear cowboy boots, right? She specifically did not like cowboy boots, right? So when we, so when we were online dating, I never saw Donna. Even well, because though, I was a different age. Right, and also, I, you know, my preference or whatever was somebody you know, a little bit younger. So I had those preferences. I had those big, that picture, that box. Right? But it's not until we start to loosen those distinctions and soften those preferences that we let life bring us what it wants to bring us that may not look exactly like what we want it to look like or think it should like, look like, but actually could be so much better so much better. But if we have a box, you know, God, Great Spirit, the universe, I want this and I want it to look like this, then actually the universe has a very small channel, a very controlled channel to bring you what you want, to bring you what you're aspiring to. But if you start to say, I just want to feel love for someone, I want to feel intimacy, for example. If you start to ask for the feeling, I want to feel abundant, It doesn't mean that I need a check for a million dollars. It just means that I want to have that feeling of abundance in my life. It could mean abundance of love. It could mean an abundance of resources. It could mean that I'm going to move to a place unlike New York City where you don't have to make a lot of money and I'm going to find a job that maybe pays me less than I want now, but in that market, in that environment, I feel abundant. I feel more abundant than I felt in New York, for example, making three times as much money. So it doesn't have to look like this specific thing, and the pictures are what get in our way. That's not the feminine. That's not the allowing. That's not the opening to receive. That's not the vulnerability. That's the, I want to control this, right? I want to be in charge of exactly what it looks like, and it looks, needs to look like 5'10 and no cowboy boots. And then we wouldn't have been together, right? Because I'm 5'9 and I wear cowboy boots every day. Right? So as an example. So can we get to this place of surrender? <clears throat> and surrender is a really scary word for most of us. We hate that word. I used to hate that word. That sounds awful. That sounds, the connotation of surrender is, you know, when you lose a war, you surrender to the other side, and it's like you lost. So I'm going to lose and give up, and therefore that's the place where I'm going to surrender. And then in the traditional religious language, surrender, you know, they talk about surrendering to God's will. And that doesn't sound fun. 
right? Surrendering to God's will sounds very much like the old, more old-fashioned religion of that there's somebody who has a very specific preference for exactly what they want in your life, and you're going to do what they say, and that's the way it is, like surrendering to your father's will or your mother's will. We all hate the sound of that, right? But how, can I actually start to surrender to the perfection of my life? Can I start to surrender to the process of unfoldment that my life is bringing me? Can I start to surrender to each moment and start to trust my life is bringing me the best possible thing, as Eckhart Tolle said, exactly what I need for my own unfoldment and start to say yes to it? So the Tao Te Ching um, is is 2,500 years old and... um, it is in keeping with, it's very much this yin receiving energy. And it, 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 has, it talks about how life is like a river. And it's about not pushing back on the river, but allowing the flow of life to unfold. Right? It's about not resisting, but starting to see what wants to emerge in your life and allowing it to emerge. And that the real insight is to know what is to be ahead of the curve and to know what wants to emerge in your life. And it, you know, there's a great quote. It says, you know, the Tao, excuse me, that your that the world is Tao's own vessel. It is perfection manifest. And then it says that live your life and allow your life to unfold naturally, for it too is a vessel of perfection. To the sage, all of life is a movement towards perfection and wholeness. And it talks endlessly about not tampering with your life. That the sage doesn't meddle so much, doesn't try to fix, doesn't try to control, doesn't create pictures about the way things need to be, doesn't resist what is coming to them. The sage allows what wants to emerge and sees and and knows that what wants to emerge will heal the person, will heal the organization, will heal the, the, the group of people. And that trusting that life is a movement towards wholeness, that it's a movement towards our evolution. Another line is that the sage acts without acting and all things get done. So it's not so much about our doing culture. It's not so much making things happen. It's more about allowing what's happening in our lives to change us, to change our point of attraction, to change all of the things that we're holding so that we can have a new point of attraction and allow new things into our life. And so what comes from that is, can we allow ourselves to see our challenges more, more like what wants to emerge in our lives? Can we allow ourselves to see our challenges as the energy of what's next? As the energy of our growth? Can we start to see our challenges as the energy of our emergence, of what what life wants us to become? As the energy of our self-actualization? So when challenges hit in our lives, instead of resisting them, judging them, pushing them away from us, can we start to see, wow, that challenge is trying to grow me. That challenge is trying to build the structure in my body or in my consciousness or in my abilities so that I can be more, do more. Is life trying to challenge me? We talk about this, you know, in our culture all the time. You know, what what doesn't destroy you makes you stronger, right? We talk about, you know, in my business all the time, we're building muscles. You know, that, that as we get new challenges, we're building different muscles. So this, this energy of, of self-actualization, of, of what wants to emerge, can we start to see our challenges that way? And can we start to trust? This is, the, this is the real crux of it. That solutions will emerge. That if we, if, we, if we have patience and we get into that witness consciousness, can we start to trust that if we surrender and allow the challenges to come into our lives, to trigger us emotionally, to allow our lives to change, that solutions to the, to the so-called problems will emerge naturally. And, that what, and to start asking 
When we have a challenge, what wants to emerge here? How can I embrace this change? How can I, how can I allow this change to happen and see what's on the other side of it and trust that what's on this other side of this change is actually better for me? Is actually, this challenge is trying to grow me into something new, to bring me to the next level in my life. And it's not the way most of us think about our lives. This yin, receiving, trusting, surrendering energy is really not our Western culture way of life. It's not familiar to us. It was very unfamiliar to me. And I just want to share that that's really what is emerging. The spiritual folks are really talking about that's the energy that's coming to the planet now. That's really where we're going. We're much more, and this is where we were thousands of years ago, that there was more of, of a receptivity more of a female and male balance, more of a yin and yang balance in our culture of receiving and acting, not just acting, controlling, creating, judging, all of those things that are much more male. And so can you start to look at the perfection of the situations in your life? And really important, and the crux of all of this, where everyone gets stuck, myself included, and then we'll finish up, is just can we feel the feelings that life is pushing up for us? Because that's the price. That's the price of freedom. The price of freedom is I'm going to feel the feelings. I'm going to let myself feel the vulnerability, the, the old sadness, the fear. Right? I actually was so blocked from fear up to a couple of years ago that I was not conscious that I was afraid of anything. And in fact, in those years, up till then, I was living a much more frightened life than I am now. When, but and I'm much more conscious of how much fear I have on a daily basis. And it, it's a great example, and we talked about this last week. Transforming fear into excitement. Fear transforms into excitement just when you allow it. Because it's the same vibration. If you're keeping your fear at bay, like if you're keeping your tears at bay, when you, decide, when you hear that boys don't cry, your fear is stuck. Number one, you're going to keep attracting things into your life that make you afraid because life wants you to feel your feeling to grow you so you can move on. So I'm, not going, to, I'm, not, so I'm going to keep attracting scary situations until I feel my feelings and nothing's going to change. But if you say, I'm, I'm afraid of this, if you let yourself feel that, if you express it, we talked about this last week, if you have a friend to express it to, if you write it in a journal, if you have a therapist or a spiritual counselor or whoever, or if you just acknowledge it in, in silence and let yourself feel it, then the fear actually turns into excitement and the movement happens in your life. You're no longer, you no longer have that point of vibration of fear keeping you stuck. And when you step in, and this is what we talk about a lot in TCM, and about, then that, that's when the male comes in. I'm really scared to leave my job. My job feels really small for me. It's keeping me stuck. I know I need to leave, but I'm frightened. I need to make a living. I need to pay the rent. If you can allow that fear to come up, really own it, and then allow it to pass through you, and then step into the leaving of your job. And I'm not saying everybody should leave their job, because some people shouldn't leave their job. But if you're that person, when you step in, then you've already made the change. But the fear, it's just a good example of how the resistance keeps you stuck. We think that the allowing keeps us stuck. We're afraid if I feel the fear, I'm going to get overwhelmed and I'm going to get stuck in my fear. I know I used to think that. I used to think I'm not going to allow these things into my life because they're going to stay stuck in my life. But actually, when you allow the things into your life, just like when you allow the feelings in your body, they move through and change into new things. And you attract new things. And that's, if you remember nothing else today, that's the key. If you can allow your feelings to move through, your feelings change, your point of attraction changes, and your life changes. And most of us were taught at a very young age to not feel our feelings. Our feelings weren't appropriate. Our feelings weren't welcomed. Our feelings made people nervous, made our parents nervous, our culture nervous. Right? Boys don't cry. Girls don't yell. Whatever it was. Right? So we learn very early to split off from what we've talked about a lot about from our spiritual center, from our true feelings. 
So what is normal in, in, a, in a child is no longer normal for us. It's not, it's not, it's not easy to feel our feelings. <clears throat> some people feel them better than others. And some people are good at feeling certain feelings, but not very good at feeling the ones that they deem the most scary and uncomfortable. But if you let life come in, bring you the challenges, trust that solutions will emerge, that the challenges themselves are growing you into your next stage of evolution and self-actualization, and let those feelings come up in you, that's the growth process. The feelings are, are the growth. If you don't feel them, you stay stuck. That's the price of freedom. You know, that, that's the price of, of the liberation, is to feel. <clears throat>